August the 17th, 1943. A bomber station somewhere in England. We've got to knock out Peenemunde tonight. And if not tonight, tomorrow night. And if not tomorrow night, the night after. Peenemunde is on the edge of the map up there. And here on the blackboard, you will see an enlarged sketch. We shall be using the master bomber technique for the first time. The master bomber himself will be sitting over the target and will direct the main force onto the aiming point. Four top to all crews. Four top to all crews. Begin bombing on the red markers. They are accurate. They are accurate. Bomb on the red markers. Main force bombing has just started, Skipper. used to be here. Aerial photographs showed a large experimental station with a puzzling layout, and in it a tiny blurred speck, an aircraft on a tilted ramp. From secret agents we learned the whole plan of Pinamunda, the home of the V-1. The war was entering a new phase. Since the 1920s, the Germans have been experimenting with new forms of propulsion, mainly the rocket, first on the ground, then in the air. They had persevered through the years with many failures, many freaks and misfires, but a slowly mounting history of success. Once the rocket had been proved, they began fitting it to conventional aircraft as a booster at takeoff. First to gliders. Then to their piston-engined warplanes. Then to small pilotless flying machines, glider bombs and anti-aircraft missiles. Then by 1943 the V-1, driven not by rocket but by pulse jet. On June the 13th, 1944, the first V-1 was fired on London. we can see them coming on our radar tubes. They cross our screens in a ruthless looking line straighter than any piloted aircraft flies. They seem to do nearly 400 miles an hour. We have to plot them very quickly or there won't be a hope of shooting them down before they reach the coast or even the city itself. They come one after another, night and day, hundreds of them. Our fastest fighters, stripped down tempests, typhoons and spitfires, can hardly catch them and everyone that gets through can lay waste a street.
There are new weapons to face and new weapons to make and handle. The turbojet pioneered by Frank Whittle is coming into service. I had the idea in 1929, but it wasn't until 1937 that we had an engine on the test bed. We had many disappointments in the early days, partly because being a gas turbine, it was an entirely different kind of engine from any previous one, and partly because we had so little money. But after the outbreak of war, work speeded up a lot and we had our first successful flight tests at Cranwell in May of 41. In 1942, the trials of the Gloucester Whittle E-28 were continued at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. While the Germans fire their pilotless machines, we've been putting a sharper edge of power and speed into our pilots' hands. From this has been born the twin jet meteor. The first squadron is in action by the summer of 44. And in July 44, we replan our defenses. Anti-aircraft guns are moved to the south coast and the balloon barrage is strengthened around London. This leaves all the sky above Kent and Surrey and over the channel free for our fighters. Now the battle has reached its peak, its testing point. July the 15th, flying bombs are being launched at a rate of 100 a day, over half of which are getting through to London. Already 3,000 people have been killed and 10,000 seriously injured. The attacks continue. Blue 3, one damaged aircraft pancaking before you. Over. I want to call up Barnard. Keep out of his way. Call up Barnard. This is Lovelace Blue 4. Airfield in sight. Coming straight here. Over. Roger. Airfield clear. Out. August the 28th. Out of 97 bombs approaching these shores today, only four reached London. At the beginning of the bombardment, two months ago, 
There was, on average, one death for every bomb launched. Now it takes three bombs to kill one person. But the attacks will not end until we have captured or destroyed all the launching sites along the French coast. This operation is called Crossbow. By the end of 1943, over 60 sites had been spotted by aerial reconnaissance. And by the end of April 44, most of them have been knocked out by bombs. All this summer, our fighter bombers and bombers have been hammering away at Operation Crossbow. reports of the bombing and study maps of the Western Front. Only when the front has been pushed up the coast where the V1s come from will we feel safe. The time goes by and our troops are held up at Caen and Falaise by the German army. July the 8th, our bombing forces are switched to the battlefront. the news, read by Frederick Greiswood. British troops in France are moving forward on the heels of a German withdrawal. Our correspondent Howard Marshall says that our troops were pressing forward all this morning and that the hinge of the German line is smashed. Every campaign is cratered with separate battles. And in the campaign of the West, the widest craters mark Falaise and Caen. Among these ruined homes, a German army was broken. And because of this, the Allied armies can drive into the heart of France. The first Canadian, the second British, the first and third American, the fighting French. August the 7th. Von Kluger makes a last desperate counterattack against the center of the Allied line. The remains of six panzer divisions are thrown into battle on a plan provided personally by the Führer. But the Luftwaffe is no longer there to support them. <laughs> Only Allied aircraft attend this battle, mainly rocket-firing typhoons of the Royal Air Force. Patrolling the battlefront, they're on direct call from our leading ground forces. We laid on this drill specially for the breakout. We have RAF officers in radio-equipped tanks with the armoured spearheads, and they just whistle the fighters down wherever they're wanted. in hundreds, and we could do nothing against them. 
we were forced to give up the little ground we had gained. Out of 400 tanks, more than half lie burning in the battlefield. The German grip on France is now unclenched. After four years, the Allies are driving north again. The Blitzkrieg has failed. The V1 has failed. The Luftwaffe and the Wehrmacht have failed. And the price of failure he has written all along the road to Paris. today, broadcasts on the Paris wavelength have been describing how General Leclerc's French armored division has arrived in the capital, linked up with the forces of the interior, and is taking part in the mopping up of the German units still resisting. First detachments of the division got into Paris yesterday. By this morning, the division was arriving in strength and getting a delirious reception. As the main units passed through the city, the bells rang out in welcome. This is the BBC Home Service. Good morning, everybody. Here is the first news for today, Sunday, September the 3rd, read by Frederick Allen. The fifth anniversary of our entry into the war opens with more news of German defeats in the West, East and South. The Belgian frontier has now been crossed by two Allied spearheads. The Battle of France is over, but the enemy still holds the Low Countries and the coastline facing us across the narrow sea. Summer is running out, but the BEF are back in Belgium, saying, as they've always said, it'll all be over by Christmas. September begins in Brussels. Another capital is freed. Another procession winds happily through the roaring streets. The facade of victory brightens a few kilometers of cobbled road for the men who are going north. Northward lies winter in the contested fields of Holland and on the German frontier. In September, we mop up the bombed and isolated German garrisons in the channel ports. Boulogne, Le Havre, Calais, Antwerp. All our effort now is bent towards pushing the Germans back the way they came in 1940. We want to finish the job in Germany before the end of the year. In September, our losses are very heavy. But those who think that Germany is finished know little about us. It is bitter to lose the fruits of war after all this while. But bitterness will make good fighters of those of us who are left. In September, the last flying bomb sites are overrun. The V-1 bombardment is all but over, and the skies above the channel seem safe again. Luftflotte 3 has gone. 
its charred remains mark a year of ruin. But there are signs among this captured wreckage of some more sinister business not yet discharged. By September the 8th, our second retaliation weapon is ready. It has a range of 200 miles, so we can fire it from Holland or even Germany against England. Every launching is successful, but where the V-1 has failed, the V-2 may succeed. It is very simple, just an enormous rocket full of explosive. It shoots up into the stratosphere and falls faster than sound. There is no defense against it. Eisenhower and Montgomery decide to strike at once across the rivers of Holland to outflank the Siegfried Line and break through into North Germany. The essential pattern of the plan is the laying of a carpet of airborne troops across the waterways. The 82nd and 101st American Parachute Divisions will be dropped at Nijmegen and Grave to hold the bridges over the Waal and Maas. The British 1st Airborne Division will land further north, the Darnie, and form a bridgehead across the Rhine. Armoured columns will fight their way up from the south and drive across these bridges into Germany. The code name will be Market. The operation will begin on September 17th. My name's Stanley Maxted, and I'm here to report for the BBC. This is my first glider operation. I don't like gliders much until they get off the ground. When this crowd's airborne and rendezvoused, it'll look like the geese flying south in the fall at home. of just waiting. We're being joined by streams of others. I bet the people of below are making some wild guesses. That must be the Dutch coast over there. I guess it's time we were getting ready. The pilot seems to be all set. So is everyone else. One of our men tells me it's after you get down you have to stir your stumps. After he lands, he'll be a fighting soldier. There's a complete absence of hurry. Yes, we're close. are the cream of the elite. They'll have to take the brunt of it while we get our gliders down and our jeeps out. How will we ever find a place to land in that mess? Well, here we go. Here come some more. They're pretty vulnerable till they hit the deck, but the German fire's rather wild and we've got off lightly here. The next batch seems to have found their dropping zone. Jerry's letting them have it harder than he did us. They 
hit a few, too, but most of the glider casualties were from crashing into each other on this close-packed parking ground. There's the last of this morning's drop. But we've had to land almost 10 miles from our objectives, and the men are pressing through along all three available roads to get to the bridge and hold it. The line has been getting tougher all the time. The men have been fighting like the red devils the Germans call them, but something has gone wrong. It's three days now. I can't get to the bridge, and I know things aren't going well there. We expected the Second Army 24 hours ago. We're short of ammunition. The Germans have cut us off from water, and we need supplies. And glory be, there they come. make it, and the supplies all went to the enemy. It doesn't seem anywhere to go anymore. The Germans are all around us, and the cannon, mortar, machine gun, and rifle fire comes through the blasted trees from all around us, and pounds right down on top of us. September the 25th. The Battle of Arnhem is ending. The landing has failed. Of the 10,000 men of the British Airborne Division, 6,000 have been taken prisoner, and over a 1,000 have died. We have secured the bridgeheads at Nijmegen and Grau, and our armoured columns have crossed two of the three rivers, but too late to save the Arnhem garrison. September ends with the liberation of Holland and the knowledge that it won't be over by Christmas after all. Behind the cheering and the smiles lie thoughts of the third river that has not been crossed of Germany standing undefeated beyond the Rhine, and of unknown weapons waiting to be launched, of the ghosts at Arnhem, and of another winter of war. Ghosts at Arnhem, and another winter of war.